One of the common refrains of our time is about how the church is dying. I sometimes feel like everywhere I turn, I am bombarded with this news. Each year, 10 out of every 1,000 churches in the United States is disbanding. And the number of people, especially younger folks who don't identify with any religion at all, is growing by leaps and bounds. We are becoming a nation of nuns and not the Catholic kind. (laughs) And everybody, of course, has their own explanation for why this is happening. It seems that every single generation has their own reasons for not joining, for not wanting to belong. Mostly we blame my generation, the millennials, for the state of religion. We millennials notoriously hate commitment. We are the reason, I'm pretty sure, that Facebook made the interested option the new default when you're responding to events. So we don't have to ever declare for sure until the very last minute, if at all, that we're actually going to come to something. But the baby boomers receive plenty of blame as well. They are, after all, the original anti-institutionalists, children of the generation who built the modern church and therefore the very most likely to rebel against it. Our words for reflection represent the attitude I experience from a lot of boomers that joining a religious community smacks of conformity, conformity, compromise, conversion. I sometimes hear these things even from those who have been a part of a church for 30 or 40 years. Oddly enough, in this case, the statistics tell us that our hope lies with the Gen Xers. Imagine that. Those rule-defying, authority-questioning children of the 70s and 80s are actually the least likely to be against joining religious communities. Unfortunately for churches, there just aren't that many of them. The truth is, I hate these dire predictions for the future of religion, and not just because I have staked my career on the idea that churches will continue to exist. Having worked in churches for the last 12 years, I've seen the truth of these generalizations. But at the same time, I think that focusing on them too much masks other truths. On my hard days, I want to just sit and vent about all the reasons that it's hard to be a faith leader at this moment in time when people have so many reasons not to belong. But on my good days, I want to focus instead on making the case that belonging is worthwhile after all. Here's the thing. I believe that church matters. You're all shocked. I know. (laughs) But it's true. I believe that church in general and Unitarian Universalist congregations in particular make people's lives better. And I believe that church could be on the verge of making a comeback, but only if two things happen. First, churches have to be willing to change. We can't keep doing things the way we've always done them. And second, people have to be willing to belong. So I'm not going to talk about that change part today. That's another sermon or 12. (laughs) But the belonging part matters just as much. The institution of churches is nothing at all unless there are people who belong to those churches. And the only way that can happen is if people are actively choosing to belong. So why belong? Why does being part of a faith community matter? I actually talk to people about this on a regular basis in our sessions for people who are interested in becoming members of this congregation. We start actually by talking about what church community is. 
I always love the list that we come up with in those sessions. Church community is acceptance, caring, nurturing, vulnerability, growth, love, just to name a few. Don't you want to be a part of that? And then we make a similar list about what membership is. The list is always a little different, but there are two things that all, nearly always come up. Commitment and belonging. These are two things that really go hand in hand and two things that can be a little bit hard for free thinkers to swallow. Generational dynamics aside, the identity of free thinker is possibly the biggest barrier to joining that people who are attracted to a UU congregation have. We call ourselves a free faith, after all, open to people with a diversity of theological beliefs. And sometimes that gets translated into a you can do and believe anything you want kind of mentality. Now that might sound good if you are the kind of person that, as my colleague Rod Richards describes, will only join groups from whom nothing is required, thus maintaining your individual integrity. Here's the problem though. Unitarian Universalism is not a group you can join from whom nothing is required. In fact, I would say that there aren't any groups that will actually make a difference in your lives that require nothing. The reality is that if you don't give anything, you can't really get anything in return. As Margaret Wheatley writes, very often the price of belonging to a community is to forfeit one's individual autonomy. If you are going to be in community with others, you no longer get to be in control of everything. If you are going to be in community with others, you have to balance the needs of others with your own needs. If you're going to be in community with others, not everything is going to satisfy you in particular. This is the cost of belonging. But Margaret Wheatley, like Rod Richards and like me, would say that it is all worth it. She goes on to say, particularly in the West, and in response to this too demanding price of belonging, we move toward isolationism in order to defend our individual freedom. We choose a life lived alone because in order for it to be our life, we give up the meaningful life that can only be discovered in relationship with others for a meaningless life that at least we think is ours. An African proverb says, alone I have seen many marvelous things, none of which is true. What we can see from our pursuit of loneliness is the terrible price exacted for independence. We end up in deep, vacant places, overwhelmed by loneliness and the emptiness of life. I would say that this is why we all feel that longing to belong that Rod Richards mentioned in our words for reflection. The price of independence is loneliness and emptiness, and so we long for community, for a people to live beside, for a place to belong. In my mind, that longing to belong is best characterized as the experience of being a middle schooler. You were all middle schoolers at some point, right? It's that time in life when you're starting to figure out who you are and you just want to belong somewhere. It can be painfully hard struggling to find your people to find the place where you can belong in that throng of adolescent hormones and judgment. And I don't really know that that ends. The hormones and the judgment seem to settle down a little bit as we age, but that longing to belong never really goes away. 
Jan Richard Richardson writes about this longing and what happens when we experience belonging in a poem called A Blessing Called Sanctuary. She writes, you hardly knew how hungry you were to be gathered in, to receive the welcome that invited you to enter entirely. Nothing of you found foreign or strange, nothing of your life that you were asked to leave behind or to carry in silence or in shame. Tentative steps became settling in, leaning into the blessing that enfolded you taking your place in the circle that stunned you with its unimagined grace. You began to breathe again, to move without fear, to speak with abandon the words you carried in your bones that echoed in your being. You learned to sing. You hardly knew how hungry you were to be gathered in, writes Jan Richardson. I see this hunger everywhere, almost as rampantly as I see news about the death of church. In a society that has in many ways gone too far down that path of individualism, people are still hungry for community, even if they aren't sure about this whole commitment thing. Even the statistics tell this story with numbers that speak to increasing loneliness and isolation. Apparently, these days, one in every four adults has no one, no one to confide in. And where does that leave us? We are, after all, social beings. We Unitarian Universalists believe that we are better, stronger, wiser, and more resilient together. And you know that in these times we are in, we are going to need all of that strength, resilience, and wisdom that we can get. I love that story that Peggy shared of the big wolf and the little wolf. That big wolf didn't even know what they were missing until the little wolf came along and showed them how much better life is when you live it with others. Life was different for the big wolf, but different in a good way. I'm not here to tell you that choosing to belong is easy, that the choice to live in community will not require anything of you, but I do believe it is worth it that committing to something, belonging to something, matters. Our lives are richer, and we are better when we belong. I believe this is true in general, that belonging somewhere makes our lives better. And I believe it's true in a particular way, that belonging specifically to a Unitarian Universalist community makes our lives better. I have been a part of Unitarian Universalist congregations for nearly my entire life, and in all but one of them, I have felt that sense of belonging, that sense that I'm really a part of the community. What made that one congregation different was actually not really about the congregation. It was about me and my sense of commitment. I showed up most Sunday mornings, but I didn't actually choose to belong. I didn't choose to commit in any other way. I was there, but I was not fully there. I didn't get to know people. I didn't give of myself. I just didn't really try. And as I look back on that time, the hardest part is realizing how much I needed community in that moment. It was a time when I was a little adrift in life, living alone in a new city, trying to figure out what I was going to do next. And I could have really used a place to help me breathe again, in the words of Jan Richardson. But I didn't choose it. Ideally, our Unitarian Universalist congregations are places that help us to breathe again help us to move without fear, to speak with abandon 
to learn to sing. This congregation here is here to hold you when you are adrift in life or when everything seems to be falling apart in our world, to offer courage and resilience, to inspire you to put your love into action. I want you to feel like you belong here, like these people sitting around you on Sundays are your people, like we've got your back. But none of this can happen without you first choosing to belong and then choosing it again and again and again as you deepen in relationship with the congregation. I can't make you belong. None of us can make you belong. It is your choice. It's not a choice that will ask nothing of you, but it will be worth it. You can't do anything you want here, but you will be loved. I hope that you see the worth of belonging to a place such as this, that here you will find welcome, that here you will be inspired to wonder, generosity, and courage, that here you will be called to put your love into action, for it is only by your choice to belong that places like this one will continue. As the Reverend Rod Richards writes, this place is not a given. It only exists through those who choose to make it so. We who belong. May we be those who choose belonging. May it be so. I've learned to slam on the brakes before I even turn the key Before I make the mistake Before I lead with the worst of me Give them no reason to stare No slipping up if you slip away No, I got nothing to share No, I got nothing to say Step out, step out of the sun If you keep getting burned Step out, step out of the sun Because you've learned, because you've learned On the outside, always looking in Will I ever be more than I've always been? Cause I'm tap, tap, tapping on the glass I'm waving through a window I try to speak but nobody could hear So I wait around for an answer to appear While I'm watch, watch, watching people pass I'm waving through a window Can anybody see? Is anybody waving back at me? We start with stars in our eyes We start believing that we belong But every sun doesn't rise And no one tells you where you went wrong Step out of the sun if you keep getting burned Step out, step out of the sun Because you've learned, because you've learned On the outside, always looking in Will I ever be more than I've always been? Cause I'm tap, tap, tapping on the glass I'm waving through a window I try to speak but nobody could hear So I wait around for an answer to appear while I'm watch, watch, watching people pass. I'm waving through a window. Can anybody see? Is anybody waving? When you're falling in the forest and there's nobody around, do you ever really crash or even make a sound? When you're falling in the forest and there's nobody around, do you ever really crash or even make a sound? When you're falling in the forest and there's nobody around, do you ever really crash or even make a sound? When you're falling in the forest and there's nobody around, do you ever really crash or even make a sound? Did I even make a sound? Did I even make a sound? It's like I never made a sound. It's like I never made a sound. 
on the outside always looking in will i ever be more than i've always been cause i'm tap tap tapping on the glass i'm waving through a window i try to speak but nobody could hear so i wait around for an answer to appear while i'm watch watch watching people pass waving through a window Is anybody waving?